Uh, so in other words, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, geez, thanks, Mitch, appreciate that. Um, wow. Um, I am here with my uh, brother Tobin and nephew Mac and my son Charlie. We're big football fans, and so naturally we're diehard Packer and Badger fans, but um, we also like some of the football you play here in Indiana, particularly the kind you play up in South Bend. So um, you grow up in an Irish Catholic family like we do, we're big Notre Dame fans. So we're going up to watch them kick some Trojan butt tomorrow. So. <laughs> And uh, Charlie, my son, who's eight, he got to go to the uh, Badger game last week. You guys familiar with that one? Yeah, so, I, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to rub this thing in because something tells me vengeance may be yours at Assembly Hall this winter. So I don't want to, yeah, so, okay, I got to do a Boilermaker thing now here too, don't I? Yeah. Um, all right, there. <laughs> you guys all sit at the similar table, it seems. You know, um, Mitch and I have known each other uh, a good while. Uh, I watched him at OMB uh, with Marvel. And when he was at OMB, they called him the blade for the way he aggressively pushed for spending cuts. I was always really jealous of that nickname. I've been trying to do the same thing in Congress and they call me the pain in the neck. <laughs> so, so I'm working on the blade thing. It's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. And I gotta tell you, just to return the favor, nobody has personified this better than your standard-setting, trailblazing governor, Mitch Daniels. <laughs> he backs up his words with his actions. Nobody has done more to advance the cause and commitment to economic growth, to display the passion for upward mobility and uh, give us a record of principled leadership. He set the gold standard for what it takes to be a great, fine public servant. And thank you for showing us. The great thing we have in common, we're neighbors with Illinois. <laughs> Do I need to say anything more? <laughs> but I gotta say, it must be something in the water here. Because you have this great congressional delegation you have sent to Washington. First of all, thank you for sending us these fantastic new members of Congress. Look, you got this thoracic surgeon over in the bloody eighth, Larry Bouchon. You got the Todds, Rakita, and Young, and Marlon Stutzman. These guys are awesome. Rakita, Young, and Stutzman, we all work together on the House Budget Committee. And when we laid these ideas out there in 2008, we called it the Roadmap for America's Future then. It was an idea to basically tackle our country's fiscal challenges head on with specifics. Well, other than Mike Pence and Paul Ryan, we had five co-sponsors with that idea. <laughs> then we got 13 co-sponsors in the next session of Congress. This session of Congress, because of these new people who came not for careers in Washington, but to advance the, the cause of liberty, we passed it. It was the easiest vote we've had to pass a budget in modern history. Thanks to the people you sent us, so thank you for that. <laughs> and I just want to say, I've, I've served in Congress since um, the 98 election. Uh, that was a tough time for Republicans. Uh, we had some reinforcements come in the next one. And one of the people who I became closest with, who's one of my dearest friends in Congress, is going to be your next governor. That guy's name is Mike Pence. You already know how a stalwart conservative he is. You already know Mike's credentials on policy, on vision, but you probably don't know the kind of natural leader that he is. Look, he was for conservative fiscal policy before it was cool. <laughs> Remember earmarks? Remember bridges to nowhere? There were a handful of people at the tip of the spear fighting that, and we were in the minority of the majority that time, and Mike Pence was way out there in front. That's why he became the head of the Republican Study Committee, the Conservative Caucus in government, in Congress. This is why he was unanimously elected to serve as our conference chairman, to be our spokesperson for our Congress when we were trying to take back the House of Representatives, which we did. So I just gotta tell you, you have a natural leader 
And it's going to be really big shoes that this person has to fill, and Mike's the kind of guy who's up to it. So we're going to lose a great colleague, but you're going to get a great leader in your governor, Mike Pence. You know, you come to these speeches. Uh, we have a lot of these in Wisconsin. Uh, and every speaker basically comes up and says, this is the most important election. Have you heard that one before? Guess what? <laughs> this is the most important election. And this time we mean it. <laughs> I truly believe that the next election will determine whether America renames an exceptional nation, the one that it was founded to be, or whether it becomes something else. One welfare state among many, in doubt, in decline, and in debt. We're both, we're all Midwesterners, so I'll just be blunt. We got a choice to make. It's a pretty clear choice. Here's the choice. Do we want to stay on the path that we are on, debt, dependency, doubt, decline, or do we want to restore those principles that made us exceptional and put us back on the path of prosperity? Let's review for a moment the path that we are on, where we stand right now. It pains me to say this, but it's become clear that the president has committed us to the current path. Higher taxes, more dependency, more bureaucratic control, in action on the drivers of our debt, just not even dealing with it, and painful austerity, the kind you see in Europe. The fact that the president has chosen this path brings me and you great disappointment. We were proud on his inauguration day. We remember his promises to unite the country and to build a sustainable recovery. Remember those statements like, there aren't red states, there aren't blue states, they're United States of America? Want to be a uniter, not a divider? Well, regretfully, he's chosen what I would call a very, very different path than the one we thought we were getting at the time. And I think we're locked into a path of decline because that's locked into law. So let's review this path for a moment. I know it's not a pleasant subject, but I think if we're going to examine the choices we have before us as a country, we've got to look at it really candidly. Take a look at taxes. We're not growing our economy like we need to. 1.3% growth this year. I mean, just to get back to where unemployment was before the recession started, we had to create 250,000 jobs every month for five years in this country. And I don't think you do that by cranking up taxes on the American people and on American businesses. <laughs> A lot of folks are asking, well, gosh, why aren't businesses hiring? Well, look at what's facing them. In 14 months' time, the top tax rate on individuals goes to 44.8% effectively. The president, Senator Luger, Senator Coates, they voted against this bill, but in the Senate, they're trying to raise that top tax rate to 50%. Here's the issue. This is not a tax rate on baseball players, on movie stars, and Wall Street CEOs. In Wisconsin, 90% of our businesses, 9 out of 10, pay their taxes as individuals. In Indiana, 94% of your businesses file their taxes as individuals. We call them pass-through organizations, subchapter S's, partnerships, LLCs. 58% of your jobs come from these businesses. And we're going to raise their taxes to 50%? You know what? Overseas, which in Wisconsin means Lake Superior. <laughs> the Canadians, come January, are dropping their tax rate on their business to 15%. 1-5, not 5-0. Ireland, they're at 12.5%. China's at 25. England is lowering theirs to 22. And the president and the Senate want to go to 50 in 14 months? I don't know where that math comes from, but that doesn't create jobs. And this idea that we can just tax these people just a little bit more, and that will pay for it all. We'll just get that millionaire and billionaire. Look, let's just do some thought experiment for a moment. If we tax every millionaire in America, which consequently is mostly small businesses, 100%, just 100% of their income, it'd run the government for four months. Let's just go after all the millionaires and billionaires and businesses that make over $250,000. That would run the government for six months. And before, after you blow through that amount of money, what next? 
just letting what they call the Bush tax cuts expire and the top two rates, which the president obviously is advocating for, it's coming in current law, that would shave about 3.8% off the accumulation of debt that we're gonna have over the next 10 years under the budget that we're living under today. The money's just not there. Take a look at the regulatory onslaught that's coming. You know, Mike and I, before we had the Rakitas and the Youngs, the Stutzmans and the Bouchons come and join us and the new yet oldly but goody Senator Coates. <laughs> and I mean that really endearingly, Dan. <laughs> really. Before these guys got there, Congress passed a whole bunch of laws in 2009, 2010. Lots of bills to totaling thousands of pages. Now the regulations are being written. Now the regulations are coming through. 3,573 new regulations in 2010, 10 a week. This year, 4,257 new regulations. They cost about $1.75 trillion a year. 219 new regulations coming out of Washington on the books coming out today, this year, total over $100 million each. One of them is estimated to shut down 20% of our ready-mix concrete plants our cement factories, or in southern Indiana, cement factories. <laughs> See, my brother went to Notre Dame, I went to Miami of Ohio. I had this buddy from Terre Haute, and he sounded like he was from southern Alabama, for all I could tell. <laughs> I tell you, you guys got some other southern accents in southern Indiana. <laughs> but all these regulations, they represent a very disturbing trend that we're seeing in this country. And that disturbing trend is we're seeing a deliberate lit yet methodical replacement of the rule of law with the rule of men, the rule of unelected bureaucracies and bureaucrats in Washington. That is not what our country was founded to do. You've got cap and trade, financial services regulation, you have all these new sectors of our economy being taken over by the regulatory state. And more importantly, you got crony capitalism. Now here's where Republicans made, made mistakes in the past. Republicans actually fell victim to the siren sounds of corporate welfare in the past. You know what, we gotta stop that, we gotta drop that. Big business and big government. Thank you. Big business and big government can join in a common cause and it is not to help the entrepreneur, it is not to help the taxpayer, it is not to give us liberty, it is not to give us free market economics and we gotta stand for what we believe in. Let's take a look at the healthcare stuff. I think it's pretty safe to say the new health care law is designed to push everybody into government-run health insurance, or like they say in Terre Haute, health insurance. <laughs> Do they really talk like that in Terre Haute, or is it just my buddy from Miami? <laughs> 159 new bureaucracies, new programs and boards being created. Uh, the government gave out 1,472 waivers, though, to some favored businesses, some winners, so that they don't have to implement the onerous mandates of the health care law this year, but everybody else does. Not to mention the fact that we have all these new price controls coming. Price controls on general health care, price controls on Medicare that unelected boards are going to be implementing next year. If I could sum up the approach to health care and the difference that we believe in, patient-centered, consumer-directed health care, in one sentence, I would basically say it is this. Our plan is to empower patients. Their plan is to empower bureaucrats. If you take a look at all these ideas, take a look at the fact that our debt is literally about to get out of our control. And that's the issue I more or less specialize on. Just looking a few years down the road, 2025, that's the year where three programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, plus just the interest we pay to finance them, consumes 100% of all federal revenues. No money for anything else. You know, Charlie, he's eight. I'm 41. I asked the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, you know, what are the tax rates gonna have to be on my kids when they're my age? You know, when, when hopefully I'm having some grandkids. They said, you know, we can run those numbers. We do this thing called generational accounting. We'll, we'll get back to you. You know, Al Hubbard knows how this stuff works. So they got back to me and they said, well, the lowest tax bracket, the one that lower income payers pay, that will go to 25%. The middle income tax bracket for middle income taxpayers, that will have to go to 66%. And the top tax rate, the one that all those 
you know, successful small businesses pay, that's going to have to go to 88%. And then in the next sentence, they said, you know, this could have some negative effects on the economy at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so even the government bean counters got this thing figured out. The point is, if we don't get this under control pretty soon, we're going to lose control of the situation. Our interest on in our debt at the end of the decade is a trillion dollars. We know we're on the wrong path. And there's one word that sort of describes all of this and what it is doing to our economy. If I could sum it up in one word, it's uncertainty. Businesses have no idea what their taxes are gonna be in 14 months. They have no idea what this next new regulatory regime is gonna do to them in the cost. They have no clue how this new healthcare law is gonna affect them. And if Washington keeps ducking the debt, they have no idea what kind of inflation rate and interest rates we're gonna be faced with. I gotta tell you, one of the basic fundamental things of governing is budgeting. Do you guys budget here in the state of Indiana? Yeah, <laughs> you do. Do you budget here in, this, in the city of Indianapolis? You do. Do you budget in your families? Yeah, guess what? United States Senate, not because of your senators, but United States Senate, they decided to not budget. They decided for over 900 days, they just wouldn't even bother passing a budget. So the government doesn't have a budget for two years now. You know, it's funny. We had this law called the 1974 Budget Act. And what's weird about this law is the law says you need to pass a budget. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Every April, by April, the House and the Senate, they need to pass a budget. We passed ours with the help of Stutzman, Rakita, and Young. We wrote a budget. It balances the budget. It pays off our debt, fixes our tax system. We passed it. But to get anywhere, you know, the guys in the Senate had to pass something. So our senators, they voted for our budget. They voted to balance the budget, to pay off the debt, to reform the tax code, to save Medicare from bankruptcy. But the people who run the Senate, they decided, you know what? Just too much. We're not going to do it. So we haven't had a budget for two years in this country. And so we're living under the first Obama budget, one that spends $46 trillion over the next 10 years. Now, if you want to get a sense of what this looks like at the end of this path, the one we're on, look no further than Europe. If you want to see what the kind of social chaos that can result from kicking the can down the road, turn on the TV and look at the young Greek kid lobbing the Molotov cocktail at the riot police. If we copy European policies, guess what? We're going to get European results. This leads me to the biggest concern I have, which is I fear we're coming close to two tipping points in this country, a moral tipping point and a fiscal tipping point. The fiscal tipping point is what I just said, the debt. The debt could literally get away from us. It could be a situation where we lose control of our own economic, fiscal and economic situation in just a few short years. A tipping point where we can't reverse it and get our economy growing and prosperous again. The other tipping point's a little more insidious. It's a moral tipping point. It's a tipping point where we permanently move to a society that has a net majority of takers versus makers. This is more concerning. Big think tank that I'm a big fan of called the Tax Foundation runs a lot of numbers. And yeah, I'm kind of a numbers guy, so I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. But if there's one that you remember, remember this one. 20% of Americans today get 75% of their income from the federal government. So they're considered completely dependent. Another 20% of Americans get 40% of their income from the federal government, so they're reliant. According to the Tax Foundation, over 60% of Americans today get more benefit from the federal government in dollar value than they pay back in taxes. 49% of Americans don't pay income taxes. So you could say that we're already there. I don't think we are. It's a tough time, bad economy. People lost their jobs, they're looking for work. The good news in all of this is survey after survey still show that we're that American country. We're the American dream-loving nation. 70% of Americans still love and believe in the American dream. Only 30% want the welfare state. 70% believe in pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, picking themselves up, dusting themselves off, getting educated, getting ahead, taking a risk, and they have a horizon that they're looking for that they see which is to improve their lives so that their kids are even better off. So what does that tell you? That tells me 
that half the people who are in the so-called taker category are temporary. They're down on their luck and they want to get back on their feet. It's not too late for us to turn this around. We believe in a safety net. We believe in helping people who can't help themselves. We also believe in helping people who are down on their luck so they can get back on their feet. But we don't want to turn that safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into lives of dependency and complacency. That drains them of their incentive and the will to make the most of their lives. It's anti-human. So we don't want to go down this path that we see our friends across the Atlantic going down. We don't want to keep kicking the can. We don't want to have the day come where we lose control of our economic destiny and we're to the whim of the bond traders and the bond markets. What is perhaps more troubling and regrettable in the aspect about this great debate that we're having about America's future, in my personal opinion, is the way that President Obama is conducting it. Now, I know that's a little stinging to say, but never mind the straw men, never mind the scapegoats. What is most concerning to me is his new commitment to division. Class warfare may make for good politics. It's rotten economics. Preying on the emotions of fear, envy, anger, and resentment, that's not hope, that's not change. Redistributing wealth never creates more of it. Sowing social unrest and class envy, that just makes America weaker, not stronger. Playing one group against another, that distracts us from the true sources of inequity in this country. Corporate welfare and cronyism that enrich the powerful and the empty promises that betray the powerless. It's as if we're saying to people, look, you're stuck in your class, in your current station in life, and the government now is here to help you cope with it. Whatever you call that, that's not the American idea. That's not who we are. That's not the society de designed and dedicated to equal opportunity, upward mobility, and prosperity. This is not who we were ever meant to be. Now for the good news. It's not too late to get this right. We can turn this around. We have shown this. America has been down before. We've been down the same path before. The stakes weren't as high. The debt wasn't as big. The economic consequences weren't as dire. And we didn't have all these problems blowing up around our face like Europe. But if we reject the path that we are on, we can get back on the right path. And so here is what we believe. House Republicans have the majority. I think we're going to get the majority in the Senate. I think you guys, Dan, are going to get the majority in the Senate. And we are not the opposition party. We are the alternative party. That means we owe you. We owe our fellow countrymen an alternative. And we owe it to you to give you the choice to choose what path you want this country to go on. I'm going to say something that is considered kind of offensive in Washington. America is an exceptional country. There, I said it. <laughs> that can get you kicked out of a cocktail party. <laughs> Throughout human history, no nation has done more to advance the cause of liberty and to create prosperity than the United States of America. So naturally, the question that we ought to be asking ourselves, well, we have this moment, this very difficult moment, is what got us here? What made us so great? What made us so exceptional? Is it because we inherited this creed of natural rights? Is it because we have this culture of ordered liberty? Because we have this brilliant constitution that our founders gave us? Or is it because we transcended these things? Is it because we thought these ideas were sort of passe, we've moved on, we've built on top of them? Because we've transcended limited government and we've given more power to an enlightened class of bureaucrats? Tell you what, that's the real kind of class warfare that threatens us. The one where people in Washington call all the shots for us. Is it because we transcended our religious path and we decided to favor the gelatinous core of moral relativism? Or is it because we decided that our rights don't come from nature and nature's God like the Declaration says, and that we have new rights that are gonna be given to us by government? I tell you what, if we go down that path, if we buy that argument, and if government now gives us all these rights, guess what? 
then they can just as easily take them right away from us. They can ration them, they can regulate them, they can take away our liberty and our freedom, and there goes our economy, there goes our standard of living. Here's the point. We know the answer to these questions. We know what made us great. We know that those founding principles have made us so special and so unique. So all we have to do is answer this moment by reclaiming our principles and getting back to prosperity. And that's what we're trying to do. We have to come up with answers to the problems of the day. You know, you know where the taxes are headed? Well, let's clear out the clutter, get rid of the loopholes, lower the tax rates, and reform our tax system so we can grow and prosper. And one thing I gotta say about healthcare, it's really simple, we gotta repeal this healthcare law. <clears throat> but we also have to be bold about our alternatives. We want the nucleus of the healthcare system to be the patient and her doctor, not the government. We gotta have specific, bold alternatives so we can show the country that we're ready to govern. The other thing is regulations, debt, the big issues of the day. We have alternatives. We're stacking bills up in the Senate like cordwood. But they choke up the rules over there and we can't even get them considered. The point I would say is this. I'm really optimistic about all of this. You know why? People know what's going on. We basically face a choice of two futures. The reason I'm optimistic, and I'll just quote one of the guys I've been a big fan about, I've read about since I was a kid, Winston Churchill. A couple things he said that really kind of stick with me. Democracy is the worst possible form of government, except for all the other forms of government. <laughs> it's a little sloppy, can be a little disjointed, but it works. Other thing he said is that the Americans they can be counted upon to do the right thing only after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. <laughs> We're kind of getting to that point, I think, as well. Look, Republicans didn't always get it right as a party. Look at where the president and his party leaders have taken us. If there was ever a time to gather our political courage, to reclaim our ideas, it is now. The country is facing a very, very precarious moment. We owe you a real choice. Do you want the president's path of debt, doubt, and decline? The European style, cradle the grave, social welfare state, where the government goes from promoting equal opportunity to equalizing the results of our lives? Or do we want the American idea? The opportunity society with its safety net, dedicated to liberty, equality of opportunity, and upward mobility. It is our obligation to give you this choice. That's why this election is the most important election in our lifetimes, no matter what generation you came from. And if we do our jobs, you will have that choice next year. And if we win this election, if the American people choose this vision, our founding vision, then we will have the moral obligation and the privilege to make this vision a reality and to reclaim our country. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.